Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Jenny Billfield, President and CEO of Washington Performing Arts. For almost five decades, Washington Performing Arts has created opportunities for connecting the community to artists in both education and performance. Jenny has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Jenny, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So almost five decades of connecting community to arts. Talk about Washington, the Washington Performing Arts. Um, so I'm the, the fourth president in the organization's history. Um, Washington Performing Arts was founded by the visionary and legendary Patrick Hayes, who had a, a motto that people remember um, and have remembered for many years, which is everyone in, nobody out. And I think that those words are fundamental to Washington Performing Arts right from the beginning. Um, the organization was started even before the Kennedy Center was built. So you can imagine Washington, D.C. with a restaurant um, on the waterfront instead of the, the uh, monument that's there now. And the vision of people who believed in the international piece of the community, in the centrality of the community, and worked with optimism to bring communities together. And Patrick Hayes was very much um, at the front of that effort in terms of the arts. He believed that arts organizations could work collaboratively. Um, he also believed that organizations should reflect the texture and the quality of the communities in which they worked. And so if you go back into the history of Washington Performing Arts, you'll find, for example, that in 1967, the chairman of the board was Todd Duncan. And he's remembered as the, um, as the first interpreter of the role of Porgy in Porgy and Bess. So imagine Washington, D.C., 1967, with an African-American chairman of the board. Um, Patrick walked the walk in terms of bringing different communities together. And the organization has continued to emphasize its role as, a, um, as an organization that pulls people together um, around art but also around what is best for the community. Um, certainly, the priorities placed upon arts education are fundamental to us, um, and that shows up in our programs, our performances, and what we raise money for and, um, and advance in terms of our mission. And embodied by the person who originated the role in, in Porgy and Bess, you also have a tremendous variety of arts that you cover ranging from jazz to theatrical performance, various mu types of musical performance, and so on. Talk about the range of arts that you do present. Oh, absolutely, and I think it will continue to grow. Um, well, Washington Performing Arts is, is quite different from other arts presenters in that uh, we don't have one specific venue in which we perform. In fact, one of the things that I think is one of the, the, the strongest attributes of the organization is, in fact, the, the fact that we don't have a building to maintain. Instead, we perform in 11 or 12 different venues around Washington, D.C. And so the funding that we raise goes to support the artists, the programs, and the staff to run it. And for me, that's, that's very exciting to work with that and, and not worry about filling a specific venue every day. Um, the programs we're able to present, since we don't have our own venue, require us to come in and out rather quickly. So doing um, ex sort of extended runs of theater performances is sort of off the table. And frankly, Washington, D.C. has such a thriving theater scene that it's so well covered and that continues to flourish and grow. And you shape the performance around the art as opposed to the art around the building. Yes, absolutely. And we try to match the, um, the artist with the venue and with the audience. Um, this past season, the 13-14 season, we uh, developed the moniker, The City is Our Stage. And that's something that just sort of came to me very early on because I realized that as much as we're at the Kennedy Center, we're also at the historic synagogue at Sixth and I and at Strathmore and at Baird Auditorium. And I love the fact that Washington Performing Arts can, you know, true to its mission, reach audiences in many different parts of the city, but as well to bring people to different venues and to have them sort of discover new neighborhoods as they explore the arts. Um, Washington Performing Arts has had a very long history in classical music. It, actually, if you were to, to look at the list of artists who received their very first performances through Washington Performing Arts, it really is um, uh, quite a, uh, a, an extraordinary list of debuts that have been made from Yo-Yo uh, Ma to Long Long to, um, gosh, Esperanza Spalding, some of the first performances in Washington, D.C., and recent artists such as Cecile McLaurin Salvant, who's uh, a stunning young vocalist. Uh, we've had a remarkable run through recitalists and jazz artists uh, over the years uh, of equal importance 
has been the really thriving orchestral series. And of course, Washington has a very strong symphony orchestra and the National Symphony Orchestra. But in addition to that, orchestras from around the world have consistently come to Washington through Washington Performing Arts. Um, dance companies like the Dance Theater of Harlem first made its debut in Washington in the 70s through Washington Performing Arts. Um, and so those are the sorts of you know, early starts that Washington Performing Arts has helped um, sort of kindle. But in addition to that, the artists have remained involved over many years. It isn't just bring the artists, launch them, send them on their way. In fact, it's, it's quite the opposite. Um, those relationships that are kindled through that first performance continue. And one of the best examples of that relationship is, a sort of relationship, is the one that we've had with Wynton Marsalis, who first performed uh, nearly 30 years ago as a student fresh out of Juilliard. He's come every year, either at performing classical repertoire or jazz with his Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra. But some things have evolved. Wynton has become very involved in our education programs because that's very important to him um, as an educator, um, as an entrepreneur, as the head of Jazz at Lincoln Center. It's his legacy. Talk about how your organization functions and mm -hmm. how you collaborate with the, with the various uh, arts organizations that, and, and artists who actually put the material out there. Sure, absolutely. Um, well, I am a very collaborative person, and, uh, and I say that um, with a bit of a um, reflection upon, I mean, collaboration is a, it's sort of a fraught word because sometimes it means that we actually all do get in a room and work things out and, and come out with something better than we could have created individually. Other times it means that I want us in a room, but I really want to persuade you to do it my way. So I'm thinking <laughs> of the first way of collaborating, which is messy and indeterminate and can be extraordinary when people actually do um, bring the goodwill and the collective effort uh, to the table. I do um, work with the mindset of a composer because I like synthesizing information and then coming out with a unique way to frame it and to present it. And I'm always excited about the moment when something that people haven't experienced yet is experienced and it stays with them, it lingers, it's, a, it's an earworm, it's transformative, whatever it is, but I love that moment where I know something exciting is going to happen and we're waiting and then we see people's faces. I mean, that's what really drives me. And so I work to that within the organization and try to, um, A, model the excitement, B, um, pull people in in a way that allows them to, and push them to explore their own creativity and to think off-road. Um, you know, it, it's always interesting to see how people uh, get to know a new leader. You know, what does the leader want to hear? Um, how do I, you know, best represent my capacities? Um, what do they want? And once we've gotten through the period of sort of getting to know each other, um, for me, it means modeling some ideas and showing how they can how they can work. Different types of behaviors, different sorts of um, frameworks for working, and bringing teams together to uh, to meet some challenges. And, and we actually did that very early on in my tenure at Washington Performing Arts. Um, people go to places that are unfamiliar. Every leader is different, um, and with great pleasure, I've seen incredible creativity from people who, who's, in whose job description creativity would have been a tertiary sort of quote requirement. But um, with a, a large staff, I mean for, for us, we have uh, 35 people on staff. And what is your budget? Uh, it's about $8 million in any given year depending upon how many orchestras we're presenting. Um, but the, there's creativity at every level of the staff. Um, I'm pleased that most of the people who work at Washington Performing Arts have been practicing artists. They've either danced and choreographed, or they've directed. They're writers, painters, musicians. Um, they've walked in the shoes of the people that they'll be working with. And for me, that's non-negotiable, because I want to know that when somebody is backstage or at the front of the house, that they've picked up an instrument, and they know the fragility of what an artist is going to do. And your revenue mix is, um, how, how does that work? So part of it is from ticket sales. Mm -hmm and part of it is from con contributions. Contributions. What, what, what does your mix look like? Well, again, in any given year, depending upon the, um, the inventory that we have to work with. So right. if we are doing more performances at the concert hall at the Kennedy Center, 
um, it would be a higher proportion because we have more orchestras, more seats to sell. Mm -hmm. um, but it's you know somewhere between 35, 40 percent of, of earned revenue. We have very strong funding from individuals, uh, from foundations, uh, very strong corporate funding as well. We have a fantastic board of you know smart, uh, strategic thinkers uh, who invest a lot of time on our committees and who go and you know actively fundraise. It's it's sort of a, a dream board of directors. And at times you you take some very interesting risks and you celebrate some of the artistic accomplishments that have moved this nation. Uh, recently you uh, celebrated the 75th anniversary of Marian Anderson's uh, concert. Yes. Talk about that concert 75 years ago or over 75 years ago and talk about how you honored that moment. Absolutely. Well, uh, the Marian Anderson's performance on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial um, April 9th, 1939 was arguably one of the most, if not the most, important performance in American history. Marian Anderson was a distinguished uh, vocalist who performed all over the world, and an application was put in for her to perform at Constitution Hall, which was run by the Daughters of the American Revolution. Um, her application, her manager's application, was denied. It was stamped um, in denial, bites only. And through a series of points of contact, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt actually intervened and made it possible for Marian Anderson to perform on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. So there's this iconic photo, 75,000 people came from all over the country to hear her perform. And it, and One of the great topping moments in American history where, the, where Eleanor Roosevelt, who was not only the wife of, of, uh, of a great president of the United States, but herself, an iconic figure, yes. said, let's, let's do this instead. The ripple effect from that performance, uh, Marian Anderson as, um, as an example of a strong woman, a strong woman of color, um, as one of the premier artists in the world, her artistry spoke for it all. It was such, there were so many profound messages that one could draw from that experience. When I, um, just shortly before I joined Washington Performing Arts, one of my colleagues, Murray Horwitz, noted this anniversary and said, you know, this is really an opportunity for us. Marian Anderson, years later, after her performance on uh, the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, of course, returned to Washington, D.C. Things were different, and Patrick Hayes became her champion. In fact, Patrick Hayes, long before he founded Washington Performing Arts, presented her, in fact, at Constitution Hall and presented her final uh, Washington, D.C. performance there um, as well. And that led just the following year to the creation of uh, Washington Performing Arts. So there was a really important link between my organization and Marian Anderson, in addition to Marian Anderson's role in Washington, D.C., around the civil rights movement and as an American figure. So you could see these concentric circles of art, of uh, democracy, of advocacy, just circling around. So I can imagine the discussions in the board and amongst the staff where you're looking at this and you're thinking, there are a hundred ways to mess this up mm -hmm. and, and you take this on and what did you do with it? Well, so the original thought was recreate the moment and I sat with that and thought, you know, that we can't possible. do that. Not no, possible. Not possible. And also, what, 75 years have passed. Do we have anything to say that actually looks forward instead of resurrecting and um, sort of putting the past in a, a sort of um, time capsule? What right. I wanted to do was use this opportunity as a way of um, reframing what Washington Performing Arts was capable of with our history, with Todd Duncan, you know, and, and his, the memory of, of his role in the creation, with a very diverse board and staff and women's committee and audience space, what could we do that would be different? A, what could we do that could not be replicated in any other part of the country that was true to our DNA, but also looked like and reflected the, the intellectual and creative capital of Washington, D.C.? And an organization that couldn't have existed 76 years ago. Yes. Yes, very true, very true. And, you know, frankly, being in the nation's capital, was there something we could do that could transmit nationally? So it had to be intimate, local, and specific. It had to have the, the national reach. 
and ultimately it had to rec it had to reflect Marian Anderson's artistry. Um, we have two gospel choirs. We have resources of the Smithsonian Institution and the Library of Congress and choirs that it, there are enough choirs in Washington D.C. to give it the distinction of really being the choral epicenter of the United States. We have um, members of Congress. We have uh, a great intellectual sort of centerpiece and we have a musical centerpiece that we can work with and we have the capacities of our organization. So um, I was with the organization about 10 weeks, nine weeks, I made a presentation to the board and said, I think that we, that we can make this a transformative moment for us. We can um, race the engine and see how much we're capable of as an institution. It requires raising a large chunk of money. Um, let's do a proof of concept. Give me a couple months to see if I can raise some money to get this started and I'll come back to you um, in the fall and tell you what we've accomplished. Started to put together the idea. Um, here's, here's what the idea was and I'll skip to the point where everything worked out. We raised the money to be able to do it. <laughs> so what we decided to do actually was not have the event on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. We decided to hold it at Constitution Hall because of it, the power of the place and to sort of reestablish the, um, the vision of Marian Anderson at Constitution Hall. We used our gospel choirs as the base for a chorus, 150 singers. But what I wanted to do was to amplify that chorus and to make a massed choir that would um, have representatives from up to 20 different choirs from around the city. So we had, in addition to our gospel choir, members of Cantigas and Gay Men's Chorus and Choral Arts and Washington Chorus and on and on. So a chorus of 250 vocalists from around the city. I wanted to be sure that we helped replenish the, uh, the music that Marian Anderson had, had championed, so why not commission an artist? And so we turned to Esai Barnwell, who was one of the original members of Sweet Honey and the Rock, who'd been presented by Washington Performing Arts and commissioned in the past, and we asked her to write a work that she immediately jumped at. And so we had a world premiere that evening at Constitution Hall. Uh, we invited Jesse Norman to be the MC. Jesse Norman had been um, a student at Howard University when, uh, you know, before she was the, the, the diva that we know now. And Patrick Hayes used to give her free tickets and make sure that she came uh, backstage every time to meet the artist, first in line. So Jesse Norman had an important relationship with Washington Performing Arts. So every artist, every piece of this was Washington, D.C. or Marian Anderson focused. One of our board members who was very excited about this project is Paxton Baker, and he heads the centric, lab the centric division of BET. And he said, you know what, I want to help you realize the national piece of this. So he opened up his Rolodex and he called Dionne Warwick, Candace Glover, uh, the Winans brothers, Malcolm Jamal Warner. Um, and we had um, a group of artists who were distinguished by the work that they've done, many by their philanthropic work, um, adding MC Hammer into it uh, and various others. We had people who were um, activists, who were spokespeople, who were passionate about the ability of art to advance a cause, and who tied themselves in many ways to the legacy of Marian Anderson. Because she was a leader and a great artist, because she sang spirituals and classical music. We did this performance for 3,500 people at Constitution Hall. We had an event on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, uh, which was hosted by the Park Service, uh, with a, a young woman who in, did a uh, sort of a theatrical impersonation of Marian Anderson in collaboration with a, a program in Washington, D.C. called Blacks and Wax. And we had school children all throughout Washington, D.C. learning about Marian Anderson and her legacy through their curriculum and through the arts education programs that we developed and the materials that we sent out to them. So children learned about Marian Anderson. They had a chance to experience her legacy. And frankly, they had a chance to see that an artist's legacy is, an artist has, a, there's a ripple effect. And that the world and our community can view um, an artist from many different vantage points. What a great summary of how Washington Performing Arts can make a tremendous contribution to the nation, to this region. An amazing description of how the art comes together 
with the skill to present and the skill to organize. I must say, it's, it, it's a terrific story. Thank Jenny you. Billfield, thank you so much for describing the work at Washington Performing Arts. Thank you. And we look forward to many, many more performances over the next years. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for your insights. Pleasure.